embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Source. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on our Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Eunice Centeno, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Animal Science at Purdue University. Eunice is originally from El Salvador and obtained a bachelor's degree in agricultural sciences and production from Zamorano University in Honduras. As part of her undergraduate program, Eunice visited Purdue and did a four-month internship working with Dr. Timothy Johnson in animal microbial ecology with a focus on characterizing the piglet ileum microbiome fed with glutamine. After obtaining her bachelor's in 2018, she returned to Dr. Johnson's lab to pursue a master's degree studying the bacteria related to bovine respiratory disease. After obtaining her master's degree in 2021, Eunice stayed with Dr. Johnson in his lab to continue her PhD in the same area of research, but focus on how the nasal microbiome and mycobiome can be used to detect, predict this bovine respiratory disease in cattle. During her time at Purdue, Eunice has been involved in multiple leadership roles in the Department of Animal Science as a member of the Association of Zamorano Alumni at Purdue University Chapter and the Association of Zamorano Alumni at the national level. Eunice loves to learn about the impact of microbes in different fields of study. Welcome, welcome to the program, Odisa. So, so good much. to have you on. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorzi. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias a ti. Muchas gracias. Thank oh, yeah. you. This is, it's so exciting to be able to welcome you to the program. Thank I've you. been following Dr. Johnson's work for some time in microbiome. And now I get to hear the secrets of yes, his the lab. secret of what we do. The, yeah. That's right. <laughs> and I can see that you probably have been his secret weapon for many years. And yeah. it must be a wonderful lab that keeps drawing you back uh, yeah. to keep working with him. So yeah. thank you for being on the program today. You know, as typical, I'm mm -hmm. going to shut myself down. I'm going to okay. let you share your screen <laughs> and let you take the spotlight and share your story with us. Awesome. That's great. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share my story. And I can I can share my screen now. Perfect. having some technical issues here no problem okay awesome i just needed to update some things you know <laughs> okay good it looks good now awesome take okay. it away awesome thank you so much um yeah my name is Eunice centeno uh, and today is a really my pleasure to just share a little bit of my story of how I got into research. And just as Dr. Sorsa tell a little bit of the secrets of the research that I've been doing with Dr. Johnson in the past five years. Um, and it's basically titled Identification of Bovine Respiratory Disease Through the Nasal Bacterial Community. So a little bit of my background. Um, I'm originally from El Salvador, so I'm Latina. I grew up, uh, went to high school over there. And as you can see, it's El Salvador is a really, really tiny country in Central America, next to Guatemala, next to um, Honduras. And just a fun fact, the size of El Salvador is, I just Googled it, and it has the similar size as the state of Massachusetts here in the U.S. So it's pretty tiny country, but we have a lot of amazing things over there. 
It basically, you can go to the beach and the mountains in the same day. You don't have to travel that far compared to here to the U.S. So that's where I come from. And in 2014, I moved with my family to another country called Honduras. Um, so I, with my family, we've been living there since 2014. Um, and both of the countries are basically all the countries in Latin America we speak Spanish. So Spanish is my first language. So I'm excited to just like share with you my background and where did I go and, and, and got my bachelor's degree and what was my story of basically getting introduced in the area of animal microbial ecology. So while I was living in Honduras, I attended um, this amazing university called Zamorano, or the full name is Escuela Agricola Panamericana Zamorano. And the interesting thing about this university is that it's focused solely on agriculture. And agriculture is really important in, in Latin America. A lot of the countries, um, they produce a lot of corn, they produce a lot of beans. So most of the um, economy of the countries rely fully on agriculture. So that's why we have a lot of push by for the governments to just like learn more and advance in the technologies of how we can utilize those um, crops and, and, and be of benefit to all the different farmers and small farmers we have in, in our countries. So because agriculture is a big thing in Latin America, um, this university receives people from so many Latin American countries. We have people, as you can see in the picture, from Panama, El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, uh, Venezuela, all the different countries. And we all live in the same space for four years. So it's basically like a really interesting family that you build. And after you, grade, after you graduate, you're still in contact with those families, with your friends. And if I want to go visit a friend in Colombia or Ecuador, I for sure know I'm going to find a Samorano that they're going to um, host me and show me their country. But the interesting thing, and this is kind of where I started um, getting into using how we can apply science in agriculture, is that Samorano has a learning method or methodology called learning by doing, which is basically um, you take classes and the same day after you take the classes, you apply the knowledge at the farms. So if you're learning anything related to agriculture in terms of like plant science, animal science, uh, microbiology, food science, you learn all those concepts in lectures. But in like, I will go to classes in the, in the morning, but then in the afternoon, I will go to work in the farm. So uh, I will, it was a really hands-on experience in which if we were learning about animal reproduction. Then later down that day, I was working at the dairy farm trying to seminate some cows. So it's a really, really hands-on experience. So because of that, we're focused on um, a lot of research um, and how we can implement those research in creating tools that the farmers can use. So we focus a lot in how we can um, advance in the area of plant pathology, how can we detect or how can we better identify diseases in plant pathology? How can we better feed our animals so the animals can grow better? And that's when I started like to slowly touch or have an idea what research is about. And my most favorite thing about this, about this university, as I mentioned before, we have full on experience on working with animals. And I have always been an animal lover. And especially since I was a girl, my mom used to tell me that I, I used to love cows and I used to wanted to have a cow as a pet. So now it's pretty cool that I was able to, to basically be around cows, uh, learn how to manage them, or learn how to um, take care of them. And again, yeah, I started to learn the concepts and the, and the basic information that allowed me to, um, to get to this point in my life. And lastly, I meant, as I mentioned before, we have people from so many different countries and that was an amazing space to create friendship that up to this point, um, I still have friends from Samorano and I basically consider them my, my family. So now talking a little bit more of when did I actually start doing research. Um, in Samorano, we, we try to approach everything from the agriculture perspective. So in particular, I was really interested in how does the role of molecular biology and microbiology can be applied to agriculture. So as we know, microbes are everywhere and they have an effect in everything that we know. They can have an effect on food security, on environment, on plant um, health, and also animal health. So it was during someone in which I started like connecting 
these three worlds of like molecular biology, microbiology, and how you can apply it to animal health. As I mentioned before, I'm an animal, animal lover. So it was pretty exciting to see that there was an opportunity for me to use all this knowledge that I learned in, in, in my undergrad and create something that can be useful for producers, can be useful for, for them to take care of the animals. So with that in mind, um, I came to Purdue. Uh, it, when I was a senior, I came for a four month internship. And that's when I met the amazing Dr. Johnson. <laughs> he is an incredible advisor. Um, and he was just starting doing research with animal microbial ecology. And basically the questions that we ask in, in our lab is, what is the relation between the gut and the respiratory microbes? And microbes include either fungi, viruses, bacteria, everything that it can be uh, within the gut or within the respiratory tract of these animals, if affects the host. And, 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 and if we are able to use that information to either identify um, or create diagnostic tools that farmers can use, that will help them in the process of identifying diseases. So basically I came as a visiting scholar, then I had to return to San Morano to graduate and obtain my bachelor's degree. But then I came back again in 2019 for my master's. And since I started working with Dr. Johnson, I have been able to work with cows, with swine, and just to see how important the, the microbes are for the animal health in terms of um, food digestibility, um, basically how the, how the microbes provide protection for um, pathogens to colonize the gut and the respiratory tract. And it has been a pretty cool experience because um, I have been able to combine all the, the world of molecular biology with microbiome, with uh, animal science, and those apply all those techniques that we know from each of the worlds into um, creating something that the farmers can use and that will help them to identify diseases. So just of the short tasks that I've done in the lab with Dr. Johnson, um, I have learned how to extract bacterial DNA from fecal samples and from nasal swabs. So fecal samples are a little bit stinky, but we still have to do that. Um, we also have able to grow and isolate some of the pathogens that we for sure know are related with respiratory disease and just to see how they behave and, and, and what are the characteristics that makes them patho pathogenic. But also like to just, sometimes it's when we go to the farm, it's pretty like you write those memories of like being with your group, working at the farm, like pretty long hours, trying to collect as many samples as you can. So it, every trip that we have to the farm or every study that we do at the farm, it basically I think that brings the group together because yeah, you're working, you are tired, but you're also like enjoying your time with each other. Um, and also like the people in my team, they're amazing. They're really smart. So I've been really, really blessed to be part of Dr. Johnson's lab and to just and to just learn like from all my other colleagues and how they approach the world of animal microbiome, not just in terms of like how much do we want to know, but how can we use these to help farmers and in trying to help identify diagnostic tools or create diagnostic tools that they can use and identify their diseases, um, diseases that affect animals. So I graduated with my master's in 2021, but then I stay for my PhD and I'm hoping to graduate this semester. So in the next few minutes, I just want to explain just a little bit, share a little bit of the secrets of the type of research that I'm doing with Dr. Johnson. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, you can free, feel free to ask me. So let's start by, um, again, this is that of my presentation, identification of bovine respiratory disease through the nasal bacteria community. So let's start by defining what is bovine respiratory disease. So basically you have a cow, you have a cow, a cattle, it can be a bull, and this animal gets sick. It can either be a pneumonia, broken pneumonia, whatever respiratory disease um, that the animal can have. And what makes BRD really complex is that it can be developed by the action of multiple factors. So we have environmental conditions, like there was a change in temperature, or it's been draining too, raining too much, or it's been really dry. So that affects how the animal responds or how the animal immune system responds to a bacterial infection. And as I mentioned, um, we need the presence of bacteria and viruses. Um, so these ones are the microbes that are basically 
get in the nasal cavity, move down to the respiratory tract, and ease in the lung, that's when they're gonna infect and cause pneumonia or bronchopneumonia. And um, the last factor will be the stressful events. Animals are really, they're really strong, but when they are really stressed, like an example, you can transport one animal from one farm to another. Uh, you can have too many animals within the same pen. So those stressful situations um, are gonna make the animal's immune system to go down. Basically, they're gonna become weak. And that's when the pathogens, they're not really smart. The pathogens are really smart. When the pathogens, they just like see that as an opportunity to start colonizing and start um, basically produce all these toxins that are gonna make the host sick and um, and therefore you have uh, the development of BRD. So another side of BRD and why uh, with Dr. Johnson, we're trying to focus on how we can apply all these tools or these techniques to help the farmer is that it represents a huge economic problem for the producers because um, we still do not know how we can accurately identify BRD. Most of the farmers, um, they rely on visual symptoms, like um, is my animal breathing slow? Does my animal has nasal discharge? Are the ears down? Is my animal eating? But that those signals are really subjective because they're either not specific for a respiratory disease, an animal with a diarrhea can show similar symptoms. But on the same, on, on the other side, um, Sometimes an animal will be really sick, but they won't show any symptoms at all. So then you fall into two problems because you, you're, we're lacking of an accurate method to diagnose, diagnose the disease. Sometimes you can diagnose the animal and treat them, but the treatment fails. In, in most of the cases we use antibiotics, the treatment fails. So you're losing money on basically buying antibiotics to treat your animals. Or sometimes you can identify the animal, you get it treated, it recovers, but it never recovered to the fullest, to, to, to the way it was before the animal was sick. So you're losing money also in the animal not behaving or not growing at the same rate that you were expecting. Or the worst case if scenario that you don't identify it and then the animal dies. So you basically like spend money on that animal, spend money on feeding the animal that at the end it just dies. So all the combination of these factors represent a huge economic impact for producers. So because of that reason, um, because we know what are the factors that can cause the disease and we know what it, that is a really important disease for farmers, we just want to be a little bit of help to the producers. And in particular, we want to focus on can we utilize the information of the microbes that are present in the respiratory disease and that we for sure know colonize the lung as means to develop a diagnostic tool. Uh, an analogy that I use is that it's basically we're trying to create like a COVID test, but in this case, we, it will be like a COVID test, but for cows, <laughs> uh, in which we're gonna try to target um, the pathogens that we know are related with BRD and trying to identify if the presence of these pathogens are related or not with BRD development and trying to use this information to identify our animals that are sick. So as I mentioned before, the big overall question, can we utilize the bacterial abundance in the nasal cavity as means to detect disease develop, detect BRD? And the most common microbes that we have found based on literature and that we know for sure they infect the lung are these four major uh, bacteria, Mycoplasma bovis, Mahemia hemolytica, Pastura multocida, and Histophilus somni. And in a previous study that we performed with Dr. Johnson, we collected samples from um, a feedlot here in Indiana, and then we quantified the abundance of those four pathogens present in the nasal cavity. And what we found is that the abundance of mycoplasma bovis, Mahemia hemolytica, and Histophilus somni was significantly higher on the animals that we identify as sick, which again goes back with our hypothesis that the presence of these microbes are going to be present on the sick animals, and we can use that information as determine if the animal is sick or not. Another important thing that we found is that once we started looking at the overall bacterial community, we also found some gen genera, genera identified as mycoplasma to be also elevated on the animals that we identified as BRD. So after we, we performed this study here in Indiana, we were like, 
this could happen, we can use this information. But again, um, the, the results that we obtained were only, they only came from this particular farm. So um, then we started asking these questions. Okay, we know that they can be a trend. We know that the micros are there and we can use this information to help BRD development. But can we find other traits in terms of the microbiome composition that can also be an indicator of disease and that we can also use to identify BRD? So we know that in some, um, in some diseases, when, in, when disease is progressing, there's a completely shift of the microbiome community. And we were hypothesizing if these, if these pathogens are colonizing in the respiratory tract, maybe that, that, that colonization effect is, is gonna change or shift the microbiome community. So that's one of the hypotheses that we wanted to test is that the animals that are sick or that are identified as BRD are gonna have a complete different microbiome community that the animals are healthy. And that difference can be an, also another indicator that there's a disease happening. And then we want to test again, are the presence of these pathogens in an nasal cavity can be used to predict disease development or can we use again in this idea of like trying to create a COVID um, diagnostic tool for cows, can we use the presence of this bacteria as means to detect disease and, and help the farmers in the process of diagnosing their animals? So to achieve that, we went broad with the help of um, Dr. Johnson and also Dr. Verma. We're working together with their lab and we went to different to four different dairy farms across the US because again, this, the study that I mentioned at the beginning of the study was just in Indiana, but we want to see if we find the same ideas, the same results, the same trends, no matter where do we collect the samples. So we went to California, to Texas, Indiana, New York, and we sampled 50 um, sick animals diagnosed with BRD and 50 healthy animals that didn't show any symptoms of BRD. So we basically end up with probably close to 600 samples. So it was a pretty big, pretty big um, project. And it was pretty good, pretty interesting to work with them and and and. To, I'm really interested to show the results that I'm going to present sooner. So the way that we collected the samples, um, as I mentioned before, there's no accurate method. We, just only, uh, we were only focusing or using a scoring sheet that another authors created. So they provide a score based on how, um, what is the intensity of the symptoms. And we were looking at, does the animal has nasal discharge? Is my animal eating? Is my animal... Uh, has the ears down? Does he have some some sort of does does it look like if it's depressed? So we're using those clinical symptoms as means to um, diagnose sick and healthy. So once we separate our healthy and our sick animals, we collected two nasal swabs again following the same idea of a COVID test, which was interesting because you know the same as us, these animals didn't like to have a swab in in their nose, so it was a little bit challenging to collect the nasal swabs, but we got it and we collected two nasal swabs per animal. So after we have this nasal swab, we sent all the samples to Dr. Johnson and I was then um, able to extract the bacterial DNA. So we're working with bacterial DNA. And then we, we did something called the 16S RNA sequencing, which is uh, a tool that allows you to see the complete bacterial community within the same sample. So after we got all these sequences of the 16S RNA gene, we started looking at, okay, what does the bacterial community looks in all the different states that we collected and if there's a difference between BRD or not. So, so I'm gonna share a little bit of my results right now. Then now this is a big table, but let me walk you through it. So this is just showing uh, the taxonomy of the most abundant bacteria found in the nasal cavity between an animal diagnosed with BRD and a healthy animal. And every column represents the different states. Remember, we went to four different states. So what was interesting for me is that if you can see on the right side of the screen, we have myhemia, Pastorella motocida, and myhemia hemolytica, which are known to cause or are known to be re uh, related with bovine respiratory disease. And our hypothesis or our expectation was we are only going to be able to see these pathogens on the animals that are sick. 
because for sure we know these bacteria are related with BRD. But what we found is something interesting and something that it was like a little bit disappointed, but interesting is that, for example, if you look at pasture multocida here in, in, purp in, in pink, you'll see that it's abundant regardless of state and abundant regardless of disease diagnosis. So this highlights another question of, okay, if this microbe is common regardless of state and regardless of disease diagnosis, when does this animal start to become pathogenic? And that's another question that uh, I'm, we're still trying to figure it out. And the same idea with Mahemia and, and, and Mahemia hemolytica, that these microbes are what we call commensals, or they're normal members of the nasal cavity. In some studies, they had hypothesized that it's what, these microbes are opportunistic, which means that when there's a, um, the animal immune system is weakened, that's when they take advantage and they move from the respiratory, from the nasal cavity all the way to the lung and infect the, 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 the animal. So that's the, 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 the explanation of it. So whenever um, there's a stressful event, these pathogens, these commensal microbes can turn into pathogens. But there's also the other side of the story of um, sometimes the immune system has to do a lot with it on how allows or not this microbe to develop. But for the purpose of our presentation, it was really interesting to see that um, these two microbes were abundant regardless of disease and regardless of state. Another thing to highlight from our results is that if you compare every column to every other column, the commune, even though they have this, the, the, the same microbes, but the relative abundance of these microbes is different, indicating that there's a huge geographic effect on how the microbial community will look like. And to test this, we did something that's called um, beta diversity. So beta diversity measures um, how similar or dissimilar is one community versus another community. So what we found here is that if you see the samples from California over here, the closer the points, it means that their microbiome or the bacterial community is more similar to each other. And the farther the points, it means that they're more dissimilar to each other. So what we can obtain from this graph is that the community from the California samples is completely different than the community from Indiana, from the samples collected from Indiana, New York, and Texas. Again, highlighted that there's a huge geographic effect when it comes to like how the respiratory bacterial community is get, it gets shaped, basically. But then you were asking, what happened if you compare BRD and healthy? So we did that. And we separate, we basically separate the samples based on state. And as you can see, all the samples are, are overlapping, the samples from healthy and beard overlapping, indicating that no, their microbiome is similar, which was again, a little bit disappointment, but interesting because that it allows our brain to start asking more and more questions, why is this happening? So it was surprising, but um, again, it goes to the fact that maybe they're just commensals and they're just, um, awaiting for the animal or 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 some com they're so just commensal of the of the nasal microbiome and um and this leads me to one of the conclusions of my story of of my research basically that um even though if you remember at the beginning of the study we did see differences in the abundance of mycoplasma bulbis myhemia hemolytica and histophilosomna between beard and healthy the samples were collected from Indiana. But once we start looking at more samples from different states, we see that maybe the disease is, um, maybe the results that we observed were only specific for that location. And that we need to start, as researchers, we need to start to account for all that environmental and climate factors that can enhance or can shape the microbiome community. So that's something that's, that's one of the biggest take home that we have from this from this project is that um, we should be really careful in terms of whenever we are like extrapolating, you know, results because we do not know what was the environment. We do not know uh, what was the weather condition whenever the samples were collected. And interesting, even within our samples, um, whenever we sample, whenever we collected samples, I know for the fact is that the farm in California, it was really dry. Whereas the samples from New York, I think they collected the sample when it was like 
close to freezing point. So a lot of differences in weather and it is really also like really interesting to see how this difference in like weather, environment, geographic locations can have a huge impact on how the microbiome is shaped, which is something that personally me as a, as a microbiologist is, is really interesting and, and it just makes me think about more about like how can we um, account for this effect to better have a clear idea of what are the commensal members and how these commensal members are being shaped and, and, and affected by these environmental conditions. So as an overall conclusion um, from this short store, um, study, BRD development does not require specific nasal bacterial composition. As we mentioned before, we try to see if the abundance of those four pathogens were only present on the sick animals, but it seems that they're not. And maybe there can be another issue of animal, uh, the animal's immune system. Maybe it can be an issue of it was a bacterial infection, not a it was a viral infection, not a bacterial infection. And um, which is interesting is that again, BRD can also happen on different microbiome composition. Again, if you look at the graph, you see California has a completely different microbiome composition than the other states, but we still see uh, development of BRD cases on those farms. So what do we do? What do we want to do in the future? And this is kind of like um, part of part of these uh, future directions are going to be included on my thesis dissertation. Um, we're quantifying the abundance of these microbes or the four pathogens that I mentioned before using qPCR. And we're hoping to find uh, differences like the same, similar to our result that we found from um, at the beginning of the study in the Indiana sample. That can help us in the process of um, creating the diagnostic tool. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do um, if identify if the abundance of these pathogens is different between a healthy and a beauty animal. Also, um, the results that I show come from a dairy farm. And we, as an animal scientist, we know that beef cattle and dairy cattle are completely different. You have completely different breeds, uh, completely different, uh, the way that they metabolize uh, and digest is completely different. So we want to see if the same patterns that we see in the dairy cattle are, are similar on the beef cattle. So that's gonna another part of the story that I'm gonna include on my dissertation. And lastly, I'm really interested to combine or to have the full story of the bacterial profile, the viral profile, but also include a little bit of the animal health. Uh, we can we can measure some immune proteins in it that can also help us in the process of um, identifying BRD. So um, this is a little bit of what I have, and I'm really interested in this has been um, I really can I say up and down type of research because um, I've learned a lot and um, it just allowed me to ask more questions and to understand and to just come to the conclusion that microbes are really amazing and we should not take it for granted and they have a huge impact in basically everything that we do so it's pretty cool that I'm basically utilizing my molecular biology microbiology and how I can use that knowledge that I have to create or, or to develop something that it can be useful for farmers and help them in the process of uh, diagnosing bovine respiratory disease. So yeah, those are my Twitter and my LinkedIn information if you wanna follow me, but this is everything that I have for this meeting. And thank you so much for just giving me the opportunity to share my story and what I'm doing right now. And if you have any questions, you can just ask me. Fantastic. What an awesome talk. Thank you so much, Onise. It was it was really a great um a great introduction to the Samorano University. Tell us a little bit more about that. And yeah. if you don't mind, maybe you can stop sharing your screen so like that yeah. we get back on the on the big screen. There you awesome. go. Um, yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about that experience. I mean, you you gave us a really great insight of how concentrated it is and how 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 you're you end up building these relationships that are for life. And I've seen it because I've met quite a few people from Samorano before, but tell us a little bit about the environment that is so conducive to create such great camaraderie and collegiality in, in agriculture yeah um 
So yes, yeah, San Morano, I will say is a really unique university. It's, it doesn't compare. There's no way to compare. Um, and just to put into perspective, um, we live on campus, similar to Purdue, we live on campus, but we are not allowed to leave. We can only leave during the weekends. And our schedule basically like, we start with, we have classes like 6.30, 6.30 a.m. all the way to like 5 p.m. or something. So it's go, 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 there's no time to break. It's like really intense. And I think like that environment, which is um, another different thing is like, you may want the cohort or the or, or the class that you start with, that's the one that you graduate with. Mm. So all my colleagues from from that I met as a as a as a freshman, we all graduated together as a, as a senior. So that basically we we saw each other, we worked together, we saw each other every single day. So that gave us this sense of like, you're my brother, you're my sister. We see each other every single day. So it was pretty. Um, intense but because everybody was going through the same thing mm -hmm. you were able to find accountability with your partners gotcha. and um yeah and at some point because we have so many different cultures someone has its own culture too so that kind of give us a sense of like belonging as well because you know like whoever graduated i don't know 20 30 40 years ago has the same culture as you so that um it doesn't matter where you go. If you go and find a Samorano, you can say, hey, my Samorano, they open the door. Super nice. And you're like, you're part of my family. I can take care of you. So, and that was helpful when I came here to the States because there's a big um, Samorano group here at Purdue. Yeah. So they helped me in the process of adapting, helped me in the process of finding a place to stay, improve a little bit my English. So that's that's something that I would say I wouldn't change it at all. And um, I was lucky to have that type of um, basically upbringing in terms of, research in terms of um, learning about agriculture, but also like building those connections. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that so much. And what I've learned also from a, another interview that I did with somebody from Samorano is that this whole go, go, go all day long, it starts really early in the morning yeah. because People have to go milk the cows. Yeah. You have to go do things like you have chores to do around the farm that are above and beyond your scholastic responsibilities yeah. also. But if you think about it, it's part of your schooling, too, because it yeah. creates a work ethic. Yeah. Um, that, that And so did you. I mean, I, I I don't want to ask bad things, but like, <laughs> it sounds like it's pretty intense and maybe some people were not cut out for it. Do you, was there, was there ever anybody that you said, oh, that person no longer is in the program? I, I mean, I'm sure it must happen, yeah. but it, it, it was quite a feat to get into Samorano, no? You had to have yeah. a particular process there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. That's why it's a small university. I think we have a, approximately like 200, 250 students per class. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty small. And I think the reason why they do that is that even before you start applying, they do, I remember they did like a psychological test or something, if I was going to be able to, you know, to withstand everything that I'm going <laughs> to go through. So it is challenging, but I think every Samurano mentality is that we know how strong Samorano is and we know the connections that Samorano has. So even though that is difficult, you know that you're doing it for a greater good that will help you, you know, like develop your career, make the connections. And and something that kept me, <laughs> that kept me, it was beside, you know, beside my friends, besides all of the friendships that I made on campus, it was the fact that once you are a senior, you have the opportunity to do the internship. And based on your GPA and based on your uh, disciplinary score, you can just choose where you want to go. And in that case, Samorano contacted me with me Purdue. And I was like, I'm going to Purdue. I didn't have to pay anything besides my flight ticket. It was Purdue that paid for everything. So that mentality of if I stay, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm becoming. They teach us that Samorano is, is always up front when it comes to agriculture. So we always have to be fighting. We always have to be like learning, have that open mind of like, we're learning, we're creating, we're bringing something to our, to our culture. So that's, it basically helped me to, to see beyond, you know, like I'm tired, I'm stressed and to fight for that. And to, you know, now because of Samurai, I'm here at Purdue and I'm graduating my PhD. So 
it was awesome. it's challenging and yes the we saw you know some students that it was too much for them but again it goes back to there's different people maybe they didn't really wanted it to go you have other cases that people that was a dream they are like oh there's a morano in their lineage so that was it was yes. already within them gotcha. so that's unfortunate but um i think like from the people that have started probably 80 percent we graduate so that's 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 pretty pretty cool so. that's pretty cool and i'm yeah. sure there is this support network yeah, for exactly. everybody that's all stressed <laughs> out going through the stuff yeah. but so that's really neat and I, you know i think i would also ask you because we have a lot of high school Mm -hmm. students that watch this program what would you recommend to them in terms of finding finding a way to like doing the work homework yeah. and so on because i i think the work ethic it has to be there as a sense of responsibility but people always say oh do what you like doing find your oh. passion and then it won't be like work that's true, but we all have to do difficult things before we get to really do other things that we want to play with or whatever it might be. What do you say to high schoolers that are thinking yeah. about going into college, maybe start dabbling in research? What, what what should we do to prepare them? Something that helped me is that, um, well, I'm an animal lover, uh, but in San Morano, we we learn about like agribusiness, econo economy. I'm like, I don't, I don't like anything on that. But it's like, I try to approach it from the fact of like, I'm going to be a professional. So at least I need to know a little bit of everything. So with that mindset, it just, I know it's going to be difficult. I really don't know, do not like this class, but farmers are talking about money and, and, and companies are talking about growth and in and, and, and economy. So if I want to become a professional, at least I need to know the principles of it, even though it's, it can be really stressful, but that that will like make your 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 knowledge not to be super specific, but to at least have a, a little bit more extended comprehension of everything. If you're going to a room and they start talking about stats or like uh, finances, you're at least going to have a little bit knowledge, even though you don't like it, but you're going to be able to to continue with the conversation. So that's something that it really helped me that maybe it's not what you're looking for, but those are extra skills that you're gaining and that you're basically helping yourself to become more, more, more equipped, more skilled, more uh, prepared for what you're going to find outside in the world. So maybe you can suffer a little bit, but it, it's for the greater good. It's going to help you later down the road. So I really yeah. like the way you, you put that because it's so true. We need to, put ourselves in an uncomfortable situation yeah. so that we grow in the process of getting yeah. out of that uncomfortable <laughs> situation. Yeah. And it's, it's so true. You have to really be challenging yourself uh, to do that. Yeah. You know, I also appreciate that the challenge not only has been in academically yeah. and the challenge work ethic, but also now you've also had to deal with a language challenge yeah. too, because I'm mm -hmm. sure that you learned science and you learned everything that you know yeah. at Samorano in Spanish. In and, Spanish yeah. <laughs> and then you came and you had to do everything in English. What was yeah. that transition like? Was that difficult? Ooh, it was. Uh, and as a matter of fact, everything that I do, like when it comes to bioinformatics and microbiome data and everything they didn't teach me that back home so I came here to the states taking intro to bioinformatics and I feel this person is speaking I don't know what's happening every she's just like going here and I'm like I, I, I struggle so much but um I was really great like really thankful that Dr. Johnson he has been always accessible so I had that support from him and to be like I do not understand anything of this and he was able to sit down and to guide me and to teach me these are the words, these are the technical terms. And also um, in the past, we used to have a, a PhD student. She graduated um, last year, but she was another incredible help um, that she basically like taught me and, and teach me how these processes work. This is how 
some terms that we use in English. So, and also to be, not to see, I, I try not to look down on myself and to be like, I'm not good enough at English and to be like, okay, this is my first time that I'm in an environment completely in English. It is okay not to know anything, not, not to know everything, but I'm an in I'm learning. I'm 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 exercising those muscles. So I really try myself not to put down on myself. So I think that helped me. And that also gave me the space to like take it as a learning opportunity of if this is what I'm gonna be doing, I definitely need to improve and to learn and to and to practice and to I think also be comfortable that I have an accent. <laughs> so that's another thing that I had to deal with that. Uh, oh, I want to speak, you know, that the way that uh, English speakers speak without any accent, but I, I just can't. Yes. Even though I try, I just can't. <laughs> so just to be comfortable with that and to be comfortable that it's not my first language. So I'm just, I think I'm always going to struggle with it. But um, there's always space for learning. There's always space for growing. There's always space to become better and, and to ask questions. I always have like, how do you say this? Is there a word that I can explain what I'm trying to say? And that that's what helped me. That's what helped my transition. And and I think up to this point and um and also be surrounded with people that speak English, that helped me a lot. So Absolutely. my that, that my hearing got, got more used to it. I started to like to pick up how they pronounce some words. So that was really, really use, useful for wow. for my transition. So yeah, I think I'll become awesome. better. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. And yeah. really, uh, congratulations on all of your success so far. It's really Thank uh, you so much. Uh, merit to you for all your hard work and and your dedication and really your listening to your passion and yeah. going in this field. Thank you so much, Eunice oh, Centeno from Animal Sciences Department here at Purdue yes. University. Thank you for uh, providing that lecture uh, for us today and letting us know a little bit about you. It's been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, for letting me share everything that I know so far. So it was it was pretty incredible. So I hope it, this helps to Absolutely. people. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, gracias. gracias. Hasta luego. Adios, muchas gracias. Adios. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.